Support for Ask a Christian Counselor comes from Faithful Counseling, which provides online professional counseling from a biblical perspective. Speak with a Christian licensed therapist today from the comfort of your home or anywhere you are on the go. For 10% off your first month, visit faithfulcounseling.com slash ACC. This is Ask a Christian Counselor where you can receive solid, practical, and biblical answers on whatever personal or relational issue you are facing. Tress Adames is a master's level pastoral counselor in Phoenix, Arizona. Here's Tress. My name is Tress, and welcome to the show. Well, every so often, I like to just do an episode where I share what's been on my heart and what's been on my mind, especially as it relates to counseling. So my counseling approach as a pastoral counselor very much emphasizes God's grace. And I want to talk a little bit about that on this episode. Um, You know, I I always try to focus on what the client wants to accomplish um, during their time in counseling. So it's very client-centered. But if the person is a Christian, I also recognize that there is a third person in the room that is the ultimate counselor being Christ. And I try to tap into what the Spirit is doing or possibly even saying to me or to the client because sometimes, very often, yes, the Spirit speaks directly to the client as it should be. But uh, I emphasize more than anything else also just God's grace, which a lot of us forget. We understand that we are saved by grace as Christians, but it's, it's so easy to forget that we also grow in and through and by God's grace. Very many of us are familiar with the gospel presentation that we are not saved by our works. We are saved by our trust in Christ, who was sent to us um, by God, who lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and he was resurrected and overcame death and by God's grace we can be united with Christ and have a relationship and fellowship with God in this life and the next life and we say amen hallelujah yes that is 100% true but at the same time we forget that it's all by grace you know even the opportunity to receive that message was done in grace. In Wesleyan theology, that's known as prevenient grace, which is the grace that goes before. Like even before you accepted saving grace, God's prevenient grace reached out to you even before you believed. And um, it's, it's, it's grace upon grace. And so there's that prevenient grace, there's the saving grace, and then there's a grace that continues to transform a person This is what we would call sanctification, which is being made more and more into the image of Christ. And how is that done? That's done by growing in love, in perfect love, which is imparted to us by grace, by God. And so we cannot even love um, fully without that being imparted to us. And so grace is something that has to extend through the rest of our lives But often we forget that. I think a lot of people are familiar with, whether or not they realize it, they're familiar with what I call the bait and switch gospel. What is the bait and switch gospel? Well, the bait and switch gospel presents grace and presents um, the fact that we are saved by grace as the gospel presentation. And then once somebody does put their faith in Christ, all of a sudden, Legalism comes from the back door and totally takes over the message. Okay, well, now that you're a Christian, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to not sin, because if you sin, then you are disobeying God, and if you love God, then you have to obey everything, and if you don't, then you, you've made God upset, you've grieved the Holy Spirit, and now you're back to where you started. And to me, that, that terrified me for so long because I have, and I almost guarantee you've heard similar type of gospel presentations, but it terrified me for so long because, yes, I believe that 
my salvation was by grace through faith, but then every time I fell or sinned in some way, it, all of those previous feelings of fear came roaring back. And it was because I was still trusting myself. I wasn't trusting God and recognizing that it was God himself that transformed me, that allowed me to change to begin with. And it's so, this is such a challenge for new believers, but not just new believers. I, I've seen even older believers who've been in the faith for a long time still struggle with this, where they go back and forth between works righteousness and grace and they understand the gospel intellectually, but at the heart level, they're still living by a works-based theology. And it's so insidious because we love God and we want to do good things. We want to do good works. We don't want to, to sin. But then we fall back into that old mindset of giving back into shame. Christian freedom is not just freedom from sin. It's also freedom from shame shame around sin. I've thought about maybe writing a book that I want to call The Other Side of Sin. And the whole premise is that very often in, especially more conservative churches, because my background is, you know, in evangelicalism. Um, but very often we put so much emphasis on certain types of sin not recognizing that our obsession over sin is a sin. <laughs> now, let me explain that. Um, if you read through Paul's letters, he puts so much of an emphasis on grace, that we are justified through faith in Christ. But we have this sinful nature. And I just remember being brought up, you know, in youth group or just in church. And whenever they talked about the sinful nature, they talked about things like sexual sin. In fact, that was a big one because <laughs> the purity movement was uh, happening when I was uh, a teenager in the 90s. So very often it was almost always used to refer to sexual sin. And that's in there. Yes, it is. I'm not saying it's not. But the bigger point that Paul is making when he uses the word flesh, he's referring to a Greek idea um, but essentially, a better way of understanding it is sinful nature. And what he's talking about is trusting in our own sinful nature to fight sin, which cannot work. <laughs> you, which is exactly what um, the Israelites struggled with and what, what the Pharisees are struggling with in the New Testament. And... It's so easy to do that, to kind of turn back in and rely on our own ability to solve the sin, pro the, the sin problem, when in reality, that's already been taken care of through Christ. And so in Romans, he emphasizes there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 8. And it's so easy for us to forget that. And so the only way to overcome sin is through grace. But if you have put your faith in Christ, the sin issue is settled. Now, what about when Christians do sin? Because they do. Well, we confess our sins. We make amends. But what's different is that the heart has been changed. And sometimes some people have come to Christ, but they haven't yet experienced the heart change. The heart change happens over time in a lot of ways. Um, for some people, they might even have a second experience where, yeah, they, they put their faith in Christ intellectually, but then they had a, a change of heart later on where um, the heart has been, uh, the, the intent of the heart has been completely cleansed and they have been perfected in love. And that's the part that actually changes everything is the motivation within a person is completely changed. So it's not bent towards sin, it's bent toward righteousness. Now, again, they're not going to be perfect, but that willful sin, the sin with a high hand, is not a part of the picture anymore. So I want to return to quickly how often we can use certain scriptures that talk about maybe only certain sins, such as you know sexual immorality. Um, that one was definitely drilled a lot <laughs> uh, to me when I was in youth group, like I said. But what I began to realize was it wasn't just branding my sexuality or anybody's sexuality 
as sinful because it's very easy for us to do that. What happens is that, you know, we can tell teens that, you know, having sex is a sin, having sex is a sin, before marriage is a sin, is a sin, is a sin. And I've seen this before. And then what happens when somebody gets married? They still have all that shame because they, they walked away with this idea that their sexuality, for them to have sex, to express themselves sexually, was wrong. And it's very understandable when you begin to realize, oh, yeah, well, somebody has been receiving that message of shame for so long. How is it supposed to suddenly just switch off? When in reality, we need to recognize that our sexuality is a gift and that it's actually even a holy thing. And so what is a sin? That's what I always want to re return to. What is a sin? Well, we can look at it at several different ways. There's different ways that I like to explain it. A sin, because that word is, is loaded, unfortunately, now. Uh, it's a biblical word, but when the average person who's not a Christian outside hears the word sin, um, it, it just it has a different effect. It doesn't mean often even what people intend it to mean, especially if they're maybe preaching on the street. Um so I like to unpack a little bit more and say, well, what is a sin? Well, it's disobeying God. Yes, it is. But why, why is it wrong? Because it offends God. Yes, but, but what specifically are, what's the heart of what sin is? Well, I explain sin as an unloving action. It's an action or even an intent, because we can have sinful intents, that seeks to harm another person or just does harm another person um, or harms ourselves. And so sometimes just approaching it from a place of harm, that makes it uh, much more understandable to somebody who may not necessarily have a lot of knowledge about the Bible. But that's, that's the heart of it is an unloving action. So what's the antidote to that? The antidote to an unloving action is to love. And like I said, we can love as humans, you know, even if we're not Christians. That's still there. The capacity is still there. The image of God is still stamped in everybody. But it is fulfilled. It is repaired once we put our faith in Jesus. And he imparts that perfect love within us so that we can fulfill uh, the things that we want to do. You know, in, in Ephesians, it says, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. A lot of us know that. We say again, we say amen, hallelujah. And this is not from yourselves. Very important there. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So it's not from your sinful nature. It's not from yourself. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so it's interesting um, that Paul is saying here uh, that it is not by works. It is the gift of God. But at the same time, you're also created to do good works. But you're doing good works through your relationship with Christ, through that perfect love that's been imparted in you. That perfect love that wells from the Holy Spirit. And so very often, though, this is where I think the, the bait and switch gospel is used. This, this, this verse is misapplied to kind of create this bait and switch gospel where it's only by grace that you're saved. And amen, hallelujah, you've, you've gotten in the door. But now look at all these other things that you have to do. You now have to do these good works. Well, no, that it's you're still saved. We have to remember, like the thief on the cross, that did not live a good life. He died right after he accepted Christ, right? So uh, he was still accepted. It's always by grace. Salvation or justification, which is being made right with God. Justification is by grace, but also sanctification, which is growing into Christ is also by grace. Justification is by grace and sanctification is by grace. It's all grace. And even before you were a Christian, it was grace. Like I was talking about before, it's always grace. It's grace upon grace upon grace. 
And that grace changes us. It transforms us from the inside out at the heart level. And so a Christian who's growing by grace, they no longer have a concern for sin. Now, if they do sin, you know, they um, confess it to Christ. But there's no obsession over sin. The obsession is, if there is an obsession, is over love and in, in, in showing that love to other people and showing that love to God. And they're able to do good works only as a result of that transformation. And we're not going to be perfected in this life. I'm not saying that. That's not going to happen until we're in the next world, in the next life. But the process begins now, which is exciting to me. It really is. And so I, I emphasize a lot of this when I work with people because a lot of people will still live through this legalistic mindset that, they, that they're that they still uh, terrible sinners, that they, they, they can't do anything right. A lot of people will struggle with depression, anxiety, or maybe they're just struggling in their marriage. And so then they, they hide themselves and they present a false self to the world and even to people in the church, probably especially in the church, to be honest. And so people pretend that they're okay and they're not, they're struggling, but there's this pressure to look like we have it all together and to be dishonest. And I don't think that's right. That's not, honesty is supposed to be a Christian virtue, but as soon as somebody is authentic and real and honest about themselves, they get punished for it. We have to be honest about that. That's true. <laughs> and it's, maybe it's happened to you, and it shouldn't be that way. A healthy community should be one where people feel accepted. Because even as a community, we have to grow by grace, not through judging one another. Because only God is the judge. So it's only by grace. It's only through that love that God gives us that we grow as people. And it, it, again, it's so hard because we want to go back to how things were where we felt like it was something that we had to strive toward. Why? Because that's how everything else works in the world, right? <laughs> if you want to get a good job, if you want to excel in your job, uh, there's so many things that are done by works, right? Well, that's not how it works in the realm of relationships, though, like, not even in a marriage. Yeah, there's good works that, you know, you want to do to show your love, but it's supposed to come from love. <laughs> you know, very often, though, I will hear people pull up verses where it talks about, well, we don't want to, you know, this is not a license to sin because you don't want to slip into licentiousness. You, know, you don't want you don't want to abuse God's grace. And yes, that's true. But if there's been that transformation of the heart, you won't want to do that. Returning to the example of marriage, if you really loved your spouse, you wouldn't cheat on them over and over and over and over. There's something wrong with the love there if that's happening. Or returning to the example of sexual sin, something that happens very often with men and even pastors is a struggle with pornography addiction. There's a lot of men who struggle with that. And They'll go back and forth where they try really hard not to look at it. They'll put a, a filter on their computer. They'll get accountability from other Christians and they'll do really well for a while. And then eventually they'll hit a weak point and they'll end up binging on porn for hours. And so a lot of people in that type of situation will come to counseling and they'll say, okay, well, you need to help me stop doing it. And yeah, that's part of the goal that I think is a worthy goal. But I want to get down to the heart level. Why is it that you do that? Because very often people that are addicted to pornography, it's not that they don't want to change. Very often there's an intimacy issue there. And a lot of times I'll want to focus on, well, what is your relationship like with your spouse? Let's talk more about that. Because if there's shame around their pornography usage, there's shame around the relationship somewhere. And so some people will just use pornography as a as an outlet. Um, I describe it more like a, a junk food. <laughs> it's not nutritious. Yeah, it'll fill you up, but it doesn't actually nourish the soul by any means. So how can we get nourishing food instead? <laughs> 
Um, and usually the nourishment that's needed is some type of connection. But maybe there's something going on in the marriage. Or maybe they're single, they're not married, and they want to be married. But maybe there's something that's holding them back from dating or connecting with a real person in a real relationship. And so that's what I, I want to focus on is what is the heart of the issue? And that with Christian counseling, with pastoral counseling, we always want to get down to the heart level. Because that's where the change actually happens. That's where the transformation occurs. Sure, it'll, it'll start in the head, but it has to drip down and uh, change at the heart level. And that's, that's what we do. And it's, again, it is always by grace. Love is the most important thing in life. That's the greatest commandment. And very often, again, I, I hear this bait and switch gospel and it hurts my heart because that's not what it's about. It's somebody who's struggling would get preached at and just be told, well, if you obey God, then... Or if you love God, you'll obey his commandments. Yes, but what is the greatest commandment? Love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So when you live by love, you have fulfilled the commandments. Because the Holy Spirit within you has imparted pure love in order to live them out. It's very easy for us to look at all the rules in Scripture and apply them to ourselves not recognizing that our guilt has been taken care of at the cross. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we change, not by obsessing over the rules. It's human nature to want to do that, but that's the sinful nature as well. So if this is something that you're struggling with, I just encourage you to press more into what it means to live by grace. What does that mean? What are some areas that you need to show grace toward yourself? Because very often that's what's happening at the heart level is we still have these pharisaical tendencies within ourselves to judge ourselves and demean ourselves. And in reality, we need to show the same type of grace that God shows toward us. And we need God's love to help us do that. Because it's love your neighbor as yourself as well. And when you love yourself and you love God, it makes it so much easier to love other people. When you're able to show that empathy toward yourself, you can show it toward other people because you see yourself in them and you see God in them and you see Christ in you and you see Christ in them. It all connects together. It's a beautiful thing. Well, I want to remind each and every one of you that you are made in the image of God and he loves you unconditionally. Walk in this knowledge and get support when you forget. God bless.